me too. I'm gonna, just give me a couple of seconds. I'm putting some information on the link to um, Facebook. <clears throat> In the meantime, let me know if you all can hear me good. Does it sound good for you? Send me a message and let me know. Give me a couple of seconds. Alright, so can somebody send me a message in the chat? Let me know you can hear me. Hear me clearly. And we just posted the document about Aquia that we're going to be discussing today. So can you can you hear me good? Some somebody send me a message real quick. In order for you to uh, type in a message, you have to be logged in. If you haven't logged in with an account, you don't you, you don't have to. But if you just want to send a message, you have to log in. So you can set up a profile very quickly. But just let me know for those who are logged in. Let me know if you can hear me, and we'll move forward. So Michiamo Ineye Akanfo Nanasom Da. That means today is Akanfo Nanasom Day. Um, authentic Akan ancestral, ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion. Medinde Ojirafo Kwesi Ra Nehempata Akan. That means my name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ra Nehempata Akan. Akwamu Mine Amarukai Tifimu Ojirafo. That means I'm the Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. We are on the next phase of our Akradin Bosom series. So we started out our video series. First we had three videos on Nanasom Ne Amamre, which means Afurakani Afuraikaidi ancestral religion and culture. We did a piece on the Akra and the Okrawa, which means the divine consciousness, the soul, and the connection to our cosmology and the whole Okra, Okrawa complex. Um, the next piece we did was on the Nananum and Samanfo, the ancestresses and ancestors, uh, honored ancestresses and ancestors, and we went into detail about that. And the third piece was on the Abosom, the deities, the spirit forces in nature. And then we started our series on the Akradin Bosom, the Abosom that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven day Akan week. So we started off with Awusi, who was Asar in ancient Kemet. We went to Ajua, who was all set in ancient Kemet. We went to Benna, who is uh, Heru Behudet in ancient Kemet. We went to Sekhmet. Well, we did Sekhmet first, and then we did Benna. Sekhmet is Abena in Akan. She's called Sekhmet. And Sechima, I'm um, in ancient Kemet, as well as Akan. We went to Benna, uh, who is Heru Behudet. The next piece was Awuku, who is Set, Eshu, which was uh, the previous session. And now we are going to deal with Akua or Akuya, who is Nebethet in ancient Kemet. So before we get uh, started with that, are there any questions from the previous session when we dealt with Awuku? And, and for those who are new, all of our videos that, that I just mentioned and a, a couple more, you can find on our YouTube page. Let me type the YouTube page in. All the, all the videos are posted on the YouTube page, on the Ojirafo YouTube page. Okay, and there's the link. All right, so what we're going to do is, well, first, are there any questions on that previous, um, any of the previous 
presentations that we did so far. Anybody has any questions on that? If not, all right, so we're going to get into Akua or Akua, the Abosom of Akua Da, which is Wednesday. Now, Akua in our Khan culture is the Abosom, the female Abosom, major Abosom that governs the planet Akua or Aku, which in English is called Mercury. So we talked about Awuku last week, who is the male Abosom, male divinity that governs Awuku or Aku, the planet Mercury. The female Abosom is Akua. She governs the divine, what we call the divine renal system of within the great divine body of Inyamewa, Inyame, the supreme being, Aminet, and Amen. So she governs that. She's also the governess of ritual practice. She's the governess, divine governess of priestesshood. She's the divine courieress. She's a courier. So we're going to get into all those different aspects. But those are her major functions. In your body, um, Akua governs the renal system. The renal system is the, the excretory system, the water fluid balancing system. That's the kidneys and the ureters and the bladder and so forth. So what that system does is it governs your excretory functions on one hand, so detoxifying the, the, the blood and detoxifying the fluid in the body, um, but it also excretes, it releases those toxins, but it also maintains um, electrolyte balance and fluid balance in the body. And just like that happens within your body, she governs that process in the great divine body of the supreme being. So they'll, we see her as the great divine mother. She has, in ancient Kemet, she has the vessel on her head as Nebit Het. She governs the rain waters of earth. She governs the dew that you find on Asasi Afua in the morning, the earth mother in the morning, and so forth. So first let's get into her symbolism in ancient Kemet which is ancient Egypt, of course, and ancient Kanit, which is ancient Nubia. The symbolism of this Abosom, is, she's called Nebit Het in ancient Kemet. Nebit, or Neb, is, the symbol is a vessel. It's like a half-shaped, uh, it's like a bowl, and it sits upon her head. Now she has the bowl on her head, which is Neb or Nebet for the female, and then right up under the bowl is a rectangular enclosure and that's the portion that we refer to as het. Now that rectangular enclosure is a bird's eye view of a temple or enclosure. And it looks like, you know, it looks like an architectural drawing basically is a bird's eye view of an enclosure. Het means house or dwelling in ancient Kemet. So Nebit Het means the great divine woman or chiefess. Neb or Nebet of the Het, of the house or the enclosure. But this particular enclosure is the temple enclosure, which means the ritual space enclosure, the sacred space, space enclosure. This is where ritual practices are engaged in. And even in the homes, there are certain places within our homes that we engage in, in ritual. We have ritual spaces for Uncombre, Abosom Combre, um, deity shrines, and Sama Combre. Uh, shrines for the Nananum and Samanfo and Asamanfo Pa, um, Kradin Bosom, Kombre, shrines, a shrine for the Okra or the Okrawa. So we have that in our homes, but we also have temple spaces for ritual practices. She's the great mother that governs those temples, those temple spaces. She's the governess of ritual. So what happens is when you look at the symbol, it's, it's, a, it's a bowl, it's a vessel, and then Right underneath the vessel is the rectangular enclosure space. The vessel is, is called Neb, Neba, and the feminine is Nebat or Nebet. It's interesting because Neba or Nebet, Neba, you will find Nimba, Ninwa, and Nimba in, a, in Akan culture. It has the same meaning in Akan culture as it has in ancient Kemet. So that vessel, when you look at the Medutu, the hieroglyphics, it can mean two major things. One thing is it, it's a vessel, it's a basin. 
Um, another meaning is it means all or every, like all things, everything, or all people, and so forth, all or every. So it's a basin, a vessel, that's one meaning. The other meaning is all or every, neba. In, uh, in the Akan language, you will find that ninwa or ninba, ninaba means all or every, and ahinaba means a vessel. So the same two meanings in ancient Kemet for that medut, for that vessel, neba, you can also find in Akan for ninba. Which, is mean all, which means all or every, and also means vessel. What's critical is an, a synonym for ninba or ahinaba, a vessel, in our Khan culture is kukua. That's another, ner another term for vessel. So what you have is in ancient Kemet, the first part of her name is nebat, the second part is het. The first part is the vessel, the second part is a temple enclosure. She wears that headdress. That's how you can determine the difference between, for example, Aset and Nebet Het. Nebet Het has the vessel with the enclosure symbol on her head, and she's the only divinity who wears that symbol, so that's how you can distinguish her. The vessel, Neba, and then the Het, the temple enclosure symbol. In our Khan culture, we said Neba is called Ahinaba, which means vessel. The temple enclosure, in our Khan culture, there's a, the recess of a courtyard is called Akua. That's one of the terms for the recess of a courtyard, Akua. And then one of the terms for the Ahinaba, a synonym is Kukua, which means an earthen vessel. So Kukua means an earthen vessel, and Akua means the recess of a courtyard. Those two symbols are what make up the name Nebet Het. So it shows that Nebit Het also means Kukua Akua. It's the same divinity with the same name in ancient Kemet and in our Khan culture. Now, we, we show that Nebit Het and Set in ancient Kemet are husband and wife, just like Asar and Aset are husband and wife. Set is the trickster, as we talked about, but he's also the great communicator. He's the divine messenger of the supreme being, the divine messenger of the abosom, of the divinities. We talked about the, the story of the contention or contendings of Heru and Set. You will see that at the end of the story, when Heru was uh, given the rulership, which he was supposed to inherit from his father, Asar, Ra says that Set will take up residence in the boat of Ra, and he will broadcast what Ra declares for him to broadcast. So you'll see Set sitting at the prow of the boat of Ra, Ra sitting inside the sun or connected to the Aten, the sun. So what you're seeing is the planet Aku or Mercury sitting right next to the Aten or the sun. And that's the exact same position. And Aku or Mercury is the messenger. He's a communicator, the divine messenger. The wife of Awuku was set is Akua, Nebethet. And she's the divine Courieress. She she's a courier because she has this basin on her head and she carries the offerings, ritual offerings, to from us to the Abosom, from us to the Nanano Nsamanfo and Asamanfo Pa, from us to Inyamewa Nyame. She's the courieress. In the Yoruba language, Set is called Eshu, and the wife of Eshu is called Agberu. Very often we don't hear much about Agberu, the wife of Eshu, because some people just tend to focus more so on some of the masculine Orisha, and that's, that's just because we've been conditioned uh, culturally not to focus on every, all aspects of the culture. But Agberu is the wife of Eshu. Agberu, just like Eshu, is the messenger, and he carries the prayers back and forth from us to the Orisha and the Agugun and so forth. Agberu carries the ritual offerings, the Ebo, to the Orisha, to the Egungun, the ancestresses and ancestors, and so forth. The same occurs with Set and Nebet Het. Set is the communicator, the divine messenger, and Nebet Het is the divine courieress. She has the basin on her head. She carries the divine ritual offerings from us 
to the heavens, to the spirit realm, to the abosom, and carry that energy. We give a physical offering and place it on the shrine, on the encumbra, and so forth. She takes the spiritual energy of that ritual offering, of that afare ba, and then she carries that and transports it to the abosom, to the nanonoman samanfo, and so forth. So what happens is, in Yoruba culture, agberu means the load bearer, which means carrying a load on the head. In ancient Kemet, Nebihet has the basin on her head. She is the load bearer, just like Agberu is the load bearer, the wife of Eshu, the trickster and the messenger. Nebihet is the load bearer. She's the wife of Set, the trickster and the messenger. Akua is the load bearer. She's the courieress, and she's the wife of Aku, Awuku, the trickster and the messenger. So all of that is directly connected. It's the same, divi the same divinities in various cultures under the same names, the same descriptive titles. So when we look at the function of the courieress, just like Awuku carries our vibrations, our communications, our prayers from us to the Nananoma Samafo, to the spirit realm, to the Abosom, to Inyamewa, Inyame, and carries their messages back to us. Akua takes her kukua, her vessel, and she carries the ritual offerings, the energy, the tumi of the ritual offerings to them, and she carries their energy as a courieress back to us. Now, we talk about kukua or akua operating through the rain waters of earth, and she regulates the fluid balance of earth, and also the detoxification. And it's the same thing in the body. So if you look at the earth and you look at the sky, that's the het, that's the space. And then if you look at the clouds, the clouds are the neba, they are the vessels that hold the energy. They hold rain water. And when they get thick and they get full, they get a little bit dark. And you'll notice that Nebet Het, she has titles dealing with fun funerary practices, meaning connected with the Nananoma and Samafo in the spirit realm and she deals with the dusk. She, rise, she leads in the boat of Ra when it's descending and going to the spirit realm at dusk, just like Aset leads in the boat of Ra when it's ascending and rising at sunrise. Nebuchadnezzar deals with sunset and going into the spirit realm, so sometimes they show her um, dealing with uh, funerary practices, black. She's black because all the Abosom are black, but they have a ritual color of black dealing with the ancestral realm. So she's she's descending with the dusk. Um, she has that title. In Akan culture, she has Mrane or praise names, such as Obidi Siu, which means the dark water, Ekuse, dealing with clouds, um, dusk, foggy, and so forth. The rain waters develop in those big basins, those big neba, those big kukua in the sky. The sky itself is the het or the ritual enclosure, and then the, the basin of offerings are the clouds. They fill up with the rainwater, and once they fill up with the rainwater, then they begin to redistribute uh, the fluids of the earth. So if you have the oceans, you have the rivers, you have the lakes and streams and so forth, when it begins to, when the whole process of evaporation and condensation and precipitation occurs, there's a redistribution from the great bodies of water to all over the whole region. So if you're not living near a large body of water or the dry portions of earth, animal life, plant life, mineral life, they derive a benefit from the redistribution of water that's affected by Nebit Het because she takes the water from the large bodies of water and redistributes it in billions of droplets to the dry areas of the earth mother and the different aspects of life who depend on that nourishment. In the same fashion, she does that within our bodies. Our uh, renal system, major organs are the kidneys, the ureters, of course, and the bladder. They redistribute and maintain the fluid balance and electrolyte balance in the body. The electrolytes are minerals like sodium and calcium and potassium and so forth. And we need those min minerals uh, properly distributed. She maintains fluid balance in the body. And of course, the kidneys, 
If you turn them sideways, they are the same vessel that she has on her head. They carry the offerings, the ritual offerings that maintain fluid balance, and they also detoxify and cleanse out the body. They excrete. She does, deals with excretion. She excretes uh, toxins. Spiritually, she does the same thing. So if you're engaged in ritual practice and you're giving ritual offerings, you're connected to um, ritual practices, she's the one who takes the offerings. Um, any disordered, discarnate spirits that are negative, she helps you to excrete or detoxify yourself from them so you can engage in real ritual practice. Okay, so before we go forward, let me see if anybody have any questions on that so far. Okay. Okay, so when we deal with uh, Nevit Het on a spiritual level, well, before we get into that, we also have to show, and this is all in the article, Nevit Het as Akua, you'll often see the, the ritual uh, little sculpture of the Akuaba doll. The Akuaba doll in Akan culture is shaped exactly like the Ankh in ancient Kemet because it's the same function. This is a little shrine for Akua. It's called Akua Ba, which means Akua's child. In the Akan culture, they talk about a woman named Akua who was not able to give birth, and she went to a ritual specialist, and the ritual specialist gave her, carved for her this doll, and then once she was given the doll and she wore the doll, then she was able to uh, become you know, fertile again, and she was able to give birth. And so women, now when they need to, you know, become fertile, they would get these ritually prepared dolls, and they would wear the dolls just like they wear babies on their backs, and so forth, and it would stimulate uh, fertility. So if you look at the story of ancient Kemet, they talk about Nebit Het initially not being able to conceive with her husband with Set, but then after a certain period, she was able to become fertile and she gave birth to the Abosom called Anpu, which is one of the jackal-headed divinities. If you look in Akan, and so it's the same story. If you look at Akan culture, there's another set of ritual sculptures called Nkua. It's very similar to Akua. The only difference is they have the same head structure, they have the same neck structure, they just typically don't have the arms um, to the sides like the Akuaba doll. These Nkua statues, just like the Akuaba deals with fertility and birth and so forth, the Nkua are ritual sculptures that are set up for people who made their transition or making their transition to the spirit realm. So when they're making their transition to the spirit realm, these sculptures are set aside specifically for the person who's recently deceased so that they can have a small shrine we give them afore ba, give them offerings, and of course, Akua governs these offerings so that they can help make them uh, detach from their earthly life, not be attached emotionally, so that they can make a smooth transition from this world to the spirit realm. So we set up those Akua sculptures for the recently departed Nsumanfo so we can help them make that smooth transition she governs that process. So you have the Nkua dealing with the quote-unquote birth into the ancestral realm, which death here is a birth into the ancestral realm. But then you have the Akua, Akua Ba, who deals with birth into this realm, helps to fertilize the living person, the woman, so that she can become pregnant, so she can bring an ancestral spirit into the physical world. But then you use also the Nkua statues or sculptures to help the spirit that just left the physical world to make that smooth transition into the ancestral realm. So Akua, when we're talking about Akua or Nebit Het governing, talking about the dusk, and she descends in the boat of Ra at the time of dusk, and then she's called Ekuse or Obirisio, meaning dusk or foggy or cloudy and so forth, nebulous clouds and things like that. The gateway to the spirit realm 
is ensconced in darkness, ekuse or kusu puku in the Akan culture. It has a number of different titles dealing with that aspect of transition from this world to the spirit realm. And when you're moving through that, after you, your spirit has left your body, it can be a harrowing experience. And Nebuchadnezzar is there to guide and protect as we're making our transition from the physical realm through the transition of death or wu into the ancestral realm. Some people, they don't make that, that transition smooth. And some people don't make it to the ancestral realm. What we talked about previously, they become earthbound spirits who begin to, they're suffering. Some of them are depressed. They begin to plague the living, whether it's their living relatives or other people. Some people call them haunting houses or haunting certain areas. Sometimes these spirits are around uh, street corners and causing uh, accidents. They're not dealing with the cars per se, but they're dealing with the mindsets of the people, distracting the mindsets of the people who are driving. And what ends up happening is you, somebody who's a clairvoyant or clairaudient can go to these areas, they can attune and find these particular spirits, they can see them, they can communicate with them and help them make a transition and stop being earthbound spirits and move forward. Very often when there's a, a particular corner, it's not always just there's a problem with stop signs or lights. Sometimes people have been murdered on the corner and those spirits are still hanging around. They're still dealing with the mindsets of people. Anybody who's moving by, just like if you're, if you're walking somewhere in a, in a large city, very often in, in a downtown area you see homeless people. Um, sometimes every time you walk by that same area, the homeless person is there and they have something to say to everybody who walks by. Sometimes they just say things, sometimes they try to harass anybody who walks by. They look forward to people walking by so that they can harass the people. It's not, many of them, it's not just because they like harassing people, it's because they're suffering and they don't like their condition. They're angry and they're projecting their anger. So the same thing happens when certain individuals like that die, somebody be, is murdered. They become earthbound and they're remaining in the region where they lost their life. They made that transition to the spirit realm, but they didn't go to the ancestral realm. They're just earthbound, and they're causing problems. So anybody who come pa comes past that area, they disrupt them. They try to distort their thinking. They try. Sometimes they try to get them in the same position that they are in. They'll cause you know the person to become distracted or think about something else and take their eyes off the road or whatever it is. Cause a car crash, and sometimes they try to influence the person to the, to the extent that the person actually has a fatal car crash and now they're in the same position as the spirit who's been on that corner for sometimes years um, they're in the same position as they are now so all that to say that's just an example of the reason why we have funerary practices we have ritual practices because we know what can happen when people make their transition and being a people who have been here for millions of years we have experience it makes sense and it's intelligent and it's mature to recognize that experience and minimize um, any conflict, minimize any possibility of disorder. And remember we talked about last week, Awuku governs uh, the possibility of disorder. He sits on the perimeter of the divine order and mediates the possibility of disorder. So, and mediates the law of cause and effect. So anything beyond that perimeter gets cut off. We want to make sure that we try to keep as many of our people in the perimeter and within the parameters of divine order as possible. And if you mature, you will establish ritual practices that can affect that. So Nebuchadnezzar governs that transitionary period. She's a ritual specialist. She's the governess Nebet of the ritual sanctuary of the house, the enclosure, the ritual space. In our homes, we have ritual space. On earth, we have a ritual space, the sky is a ritual space, and then the clouds, of course, are the basins that have the nutrients, that have the rainwater that can redistribute. And of course, those rainwater droplets are couriers of energy. They are couriers of solar energy, and of course, of water energy, and so forth. So she's a courier rest in that sense as well. The ritual space for the ancestral spirits, and for us in communication with them, is that transitionary or transitory period between death and moving to the ancestral realm. That's the ritual space 
and Nebuchadnezzar or Akua governs that. And when we're in harmony with her, and just like in our Khan culture, we will set up those Nkua statues so that we can deal with those ancestral spirits, make sure they're not carrying any emotional or spiritually disordered baggage so that they won't attempt to try to remain earthbound and cause problems in the society. Because again, like we talked about before, if you have sound uh, funerary practices, then you also have, if you have sound funerary practices, you also have more balanced society. Because discarnate spirits that are causing problems in people's relationships, causing po problems with finances, causing problems um, at work, causing problems just in all kinds of ways. Um, if you have a lot of that going on, then you have an unstable society. And if you were to basically deport the different discarnate spirits from being earthbound to the ancestral realm, allow them to let go of that spiritual baggage, that emotional baggage, that unnecessary and unhealthy attachment to the physical world because they're no longer here, but they think you know, they were taken too soon and so forth. If you can get rid of all of that and help them make their transition, then you have a lot less arguments, a lot less fights, a lot less drama, a lot less disorder. So sound funerary practices are, are a prerequisite for a harmonious society. So that's why we focus so much, or it appears to be so much on funerary practices in ancient Kemet, ancient Kanit, with the pyramids, the Meru and so forth, but also in our Khan culture and, and just across the board in our Fudar Kai, they always talk about how we focus so much on the ancestresses and ancestors, but that has to do not just with the after death state, but it also has to do with our everyday living, a harmonious society, everyday living. If you can deal with the Nsamafo in an intelligent way, then you can have a more um, stable society. So she deals with all of that. Um, let me see, I think I see somebody. Hold on one second. Okay, so a question was, will you use Akua instead of a loved one's photo? Um, the loved one's photo is basically, you know, a version of that. Now you can use statues, and that's something that we've used, you know, for thousands of years. But that's not the only thing we've used. We also have shown in certain articles like in Sama and Combre, um, the article in Sama and Comre, Ancestral Shrines in Kemet, we use uh, stele, which are, you know, stone uh, slabs where we would either paint or carve pictures of the deceased, um, write ritual prayers on, on those uh, specific stele, and erect them in the homes. There are also ancestral busts of the deceased person. Those things, however, would typically go on and in Sama and Komre, an ancestral shrine that was going to be um, a permanent shrine for the Nsumafo. Some of these Akua statues, sometimes they will be, or Nkua statues, they will be placed at the grave site and they will be dealt with ritually, um, specifically after the transition. There are certain days, like seven, on the, basically the eighth day after the death, the 40th day, and the 80th day, and the one year anniversary. So we would have ritual times that we would engage the specific spirit to make as they're making their transition to the ancestral realm and as they're settling in the ancestral realm over the course of a year. The first 40 days are critical and then the 80th day and then the one year anniversary. And different groups, you know, address it in different ways. They have their own ways of um, dealing with these spirits. That's just the way the icon deal with it. But you could, you could use an, uh, a photo of the person if you want to do it that way, you don't have to have a sculpture. That's the way we've done it in the past. And, you know, when we first started doing that, we didn't have pictures, of course. Some people could paint pictures. Some people can draw pictures. But very often, we would use sculptures, and they would be outside of the home for those particular sculptures. All right. Any other questions on that? Okay. So now... With our cool, so that, that's the dealing with the ritual aspect. Um, dealing with the emotions. Now we talk about Akua being the lower bearer. She has a basin on her head. Um, she governs ritual practice, right? She also governs emotions. Now, 
governing the rain waters of earth, which is that's the the earthly aspect in the body, the quote unquote rain waters are going through the renal system, uh, reestablishing fluid balance in the body, electrolyte balance in the body, and so forth, and also detoxifying um, the body, the blood, the water system, and so forth. Uh, you also that also has to do with your emotional balance. If she's the load bearer and she's holding the load, the offerings on her head, if someone is spiritually imbalanced or emotionally imbalanced, the load is like a heavy load and they can't hold it very well, so they're imbalanced. When you are receiving, absorbing uh, energetic emanations, which we do, we come in contact with individuals, of course, from the forces of nature, sun, moon, stars, different aspects of the Earth Mother, plants, animal life, mineral life, Afurakani, Afuraikani, human life, and other entities, we're constantly being bombarded with energetic emanations from everything and every entity. Now, if we're living in harmony with divine order, what we do is we take those energetic emanations, we distribute them to the different aspects of our being that are necessary for the, who need those em energetic emanations to be replenished and then anything that we don't need we force out or we repel. It's very similar to the kidneys. You have nutrients that you receive from eating food and so forth. Um, the body distributes those nutrients to the different organs and organ systems in the body and then those things that are toxic are excreted through the renal system and forced out of the body. If you're receiving energetic emanations from various entities, including disordered entities, the whites and their offspring, as well as uh, non-whites who are engaged in self-destructive, uh, lustful behavior, malicious behavior, and so forth, what happens is if you're not excreting properly, because you're not in harmony with your kra, which means you're not in harmony with akua, and we, all of us, Afurakani, Afurakani people deal with all of the abosan. She operates through the renal system in the great divine body, and she governs the renal system in our physical bodies and in our spirit bodies. So she, even if she's not the abosan that governs our akra, she governs the renal system spiritually and physiologically. So if we're not in harmony with our akra, we're not in harmony with her. So we're not rejecting or detoxifying the negative energetic emanations coming from disordered spirits, we may be receiving good nutrients or energetic emanations from the sun, from the moon, from the, you know, Nananoma, Samafo, uh, the Abosom, and so forth. But if we're not repelling or we're not filtering out the negative energetic emanations from discarnate, disordered spirits, as well as uh, people living here, right here on earth, who are living, quote unquote, with their spirits of disorder then what happens is we internalize these negative energy emanations. And when we internalize these emanations, it perverts our perception. So what happens is our emotional balance, our emotive power or emotive balance, e meaning external and motive or motion means to move, the power to move, our emotional balance or emotive balance is affected. What we have is emotional balance is our own spirit, our energetic emanations, and their interaction with the energetic emanations of plant life, animal life, mineral life, um, Afurakani, Afurakani, human life, the spirits of the Abosom, the spirits of the Nananoma, Samanfo, Nyamewa, Nyame, but then any other energetic emanations. If we're in harmony with divine order, we repel all the negative energetic emanations, and the only things that we receive are the emanations from the divinely ordered spirits, right? If we're not repelling, what happens is we receive the good vibrations, but then we also absorb and retain the perverse, disordered emanations. That affects negatively our emotional balance because our emotional balance, again, is our own spirit's emanations interacting with other emanations, and that manifests as our spirit as our emotional balance, our spiritual emotional balance. If we're not 
um, filtering properly because our, we're not in harmony with our renal system, with Nebihet, with Akua, then we're internalizing things emotionally. The load bearer, the load on our head becomes heavy, full of anxiety. We become imbalanced. That perverts our perception. And then a perver perverted perception then animates a perverse ritual practice of ritual offerings. So when we engage in ritual now, we're starting to engage in disordered ritual or perverse ritual. And then we begin to rationalize perverted ritual. So once we do that, we engage in all kinds of interactions with perverse entities, disordered entities, um, trying to label these entities Abosom or Orisha or Vodou or Ntoru, Ntorutu, and Neturu, Neturu, and so forth. And in reality, they are not. What we're doing is we're engaged in perverse ritual and rationalizing the ritualization of disorder. And if we're not in harmony with Nebihet, then that's the result. So this is the state of many of the so-called ancestral religious practices, whether they are Akan, Yoruba, Ebbe Vodun, Fon Vodun, Mina Vodun, Igbo traditions, Bakango traditions, Haitian Vodou, um, all kinds of different traditions, so-called comedic traditions that a lot of people purport to be involved in. There's a uh, rationalization of ritualized disorder because we're not filtering out disordered spirits, basically toxins. Just like your, if, if your kidneys are not filtering out toxins, you're going to have a problem. If your divine renal system governed by Nebuchadnezzar, Akua, is not filtering out toxins or toxic entities, then you're going to have a problem and it's going to internalize and pervert your perception and you'll begin to engage in uh, self-destructive practices. Okay, any, any questions on that? All right, so let's give some examples of, you know, that process. We deal with the ancestral spirits. Um, we can look at, first let's look at the Akan culture. Akan culture in Ghana and in Ivory Coast, as well as the purported Akan culture in America. What people have done is they've gone to Ghana, they've connected with spirits, people dealing with shrines of spirits that are actually not abosom, not deities, not real forces in nature. They're spirits of discarnate relatives of people that have been promoted falsely as deities. People pay thousands of dollars, they get initiated to these spirits. Um, the most popular ones, and we've written articles on this, Asurjibi, Adadi Kofi, Akonedi Abena, uh, Nana Tigare. These different spirits, there are two things. One, none of them are abosom. They are not deities. They are deified ancestral spirits. And the second thing is, they're not Akan spirits. They're actually Guan spirits. And we mentioned that before, and we have a couple of articles on that. They're the spirits of Guan people. Guan people are related to Akan people, but we're not the same ethnic group. And in some areas, the Akan and the Guan people have been at war with one another and, and have killed one another. So what happens is some of our people have gone to the region like Equiapem, and they got initiated. This started back in the 60s with Nana Yao de Nizulu. Um, they started getting initiated, having priests and priestesses come here from Ghana, initiate people to these different spirits. And they've been promoting this practice for decades now. And it turns out that these spirits were not, are not Abosom. Number one, they're not deities. And number two, they're not even Akan spirits. So for decades, since the 60s, people have been engage in the worship of spirits that they thought were, you know, part of Akan, ancient Akan religion, and in reality they haven't been dealing with deities at all and haven't even been dealing with Akan ancestral spirits. These are Guan ancestral spirits. That happens. That happens now and it's been happening for quite a while. Um, in the Yoruba tradition, you'll especially over here in America, but also on the continent. In, in the Americas, in the Caribbean, you will see that people have white pictures of saints 
and so forth and they say that they're hiding the Orisha up under the pictures of the saints because during slavery we weren't allowed to practice the ancestral religion and so we tried to hide the religion under the pictures of the saints to basically trick the whites and their offspring to make them believe that we were engaged in the practice of Catholicism and in reality we were worshiping our ancestresses and ancestors and the Orisha. Of course that's inaccurate. The Orisha never sanctioned the use of white images. In fact, they always directed the people to never use white images. And everybody didn't do that. Some people have done that, but most of the people, they didn't engage in that practice. They rejected that practice. The whites were the ones who were enslaving them, dismembering people, chopping people up, selling their families off. They were not going to use those perverse white images as symbols of the divine forces in nature. The same thing in Haiti. Most people weren't engaged in those practices. The Loa, which is a term for the divinities in Haitian Vodun, did never sanction the use of white saints in any fashion in the tradition. Anybody who says that is lying. The Loa told them specifically to throw away the white images. And we mentioned that before. Throw away those white images and then they would as assist in the liberation of the country. And that's what happened. So back in the 12,700s or 1700s, the Loa came, possessed, they engaged in ritual, people got rid of those white images, the few who were utilizing them, and then they waged war against the French and they liberated themselves. Here in America, some people engaged in ancestral religion such as hoodoo, different forms of hoodoo and different forms of uh, like New Orleans, Vodun, and different aspects of ancestral religion, whether it's Igbo or Congo manifesting in different forms, some of our people continue to practice those things in North America. Some of our people began to try to incorporate things like the Psalms from the Bible and other biblical stories and so forth. Many of our people did not do that. When you begin to engage in those practices, you draw the perverse spirits that are associated with those texts and with anybody who is connected to those kind of false rituals. Those perverse rituals draw on perverse spirits. The same thing on the continent. If you look in the Yoruba tradition or the Akan tradition, for example, on the continent, many of the people who are Muslims started selling talismans, especially in the north, but all throughout the country, going on for hundreds of years. The Akan people migrated away from the ancient empire of Ghana uh, over thousand years ago and after that successively in waves to get away from the foolishness of some of our people accepting Islam and engaging in self-destructive behavior. So we reestablished Akan civilization in the southern part of West Afuraka, Afuraikai, um, starting about a thousand years ago and, and successively, you know, growing since then. Some of the people who engaged in Islam began to infiltrate in the northern part of what's today's contemporary Ghana. Um, they never gained a grand foothold amongst Akan people and they still have not. Their numbers are low compared to, you know, so-called Christianity and traditional religion, but they still have a presence. And they still sell talismans. They still sell shrines for these discarnate spirits. Some of these shrines are called Abosom Brafo shrines or witch-catching shrines, things like that. What they're doing is they're selling shrines that are connected to discarnate spirits of their relatives, very often non-Akan people, discarnate relatives, and they're selling shrines and those spirits will work for people for sacrifice or for whatever cost. That's not part of the ancestral religion. Number one, we don't work with discarnate wayward spirits, we work with actual abosom, and then if we're dealing with ancestral spirits, we're only dealing with our own direct blood relatives and then amongst our direct blood relatives we're dealing with the Nananom and Samanfo and our Samanfo Pa and not some wayward lustful or malicious spirit. So that's not part of the culture but that presentation of, of the a mispresentation of the culture is rampant throughout Ghana. You also see in Togo and Benin and parts of Ghana the practice of voodoo. Now you'll see corruption, large-scale corruption in the practice of voodoo. People are not living in harmony with Agberu. 
people are not living in harmony with Akua, people are not living in harmony with Nebit Het. She's called Koni Koni, the wife of Legba in Vodun. People are not living in, in harmony with her. So therefore, they're not filtering out properly. So the toxins that they receive are not being excreted from the system. So now all these emanations coming from these discarnate spirits, they internalize them and then they rationalize these internalized disordered spirits into a, a perverse ritual practice of perverse ritual offerings. And now the ritual offerings that Nebuchadnezzar or Agberu or Akua is supposed to carry to the Abosom and Ensemanfo and so forth, she's, not, she's no longer present. So the only spirits left in those shrines are discarnate, wayward, disordered spirits that they're working with. So you'll see, just like in the Yoruba tradition, in, in Cuba, and in different places in America, and in Haiti with Vodun, you'll see these white saints and so forth, in Togo, and in Benin, and in Ghana, and parts of Nigeria, when they're practicing Vodou, you'll see Mami Wata spirits, and you'll see other spirits, and they'll have white images, white females, blonde hair, blue-eyed females, you also see uh, numerous Hindu lithographs, Hindu paintings, Hindu so-called artwork in these various shrines. And the people will say, well, you know, these spirits are from India. Yes, they have white, you know, white images and so forth, but these are our ancient spirits, and we are the ancient people of India, and those are our cousins, so that's why we can use these, you know, white images of Krishna and Lakshmi and Hanuman and Ganesh and all these different spirits. Whenever you see lithographs or prints or sculptures of these white so-called deities, Hindu deities, you can be absolutely certain that no Vodou are present in those temples. When those perverse images or those perverse embodiments of disordered spirits, those matrices of white disordered spirits are in a shrine house in the temple enclosure the place that's governed by Akua remember Akua means the recess of a courtyard Kukua also means the vessel and that vessel is Nebet and the temple enclosure the courtyard is Het so the Nebet Het is the ritual enclosure that's governed by Nebet Het She's the governess of ritual, the governess of priesthood, priestesshood, the governess of the spirit who goes into the ancestral realm, governess of the ritual space. When you bring into the ritual space these white, perverse embodiments of disordered, discarnate entities, Nebuchadnezzar or Akua is no longer present. And therefore, no Abosom are any longer present and no Nananom and Samafor or honored spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors are any longer present. So the only spirits that you can have in places like that are spirits of disorder, whether they are the relatives of some of the people there, whether they are spirits of disorder who have been there before those people migrated there, or if they're spirits of disorder from the white Hindus who produce these paintings, these lithographs, and these other images. What happened in like Ghana and Togo and Benin and Nigeria in the latter part of the 12,900s um, or 12,800s, meaning in the 1800s, there were a number of Hindus who began to market uh, chromolithographs in Ghana and in Togo and in Benin, these lithographs of white Hindu deities, so-called deities. They started selling thousands of them. It really picked up after World War I. So in the 40s and 50s, it really started picking up. So you have people who market in these white images of these Hindu deities. They also have images of Chinese entities as well. But these Hindu so-called false deities, they have thousands and thousands of them. That they go to the marketplace and people purchase them, and then they take them into the Vodun temples. Some of the images will have a brown person every now and then. Many of them have, you know, pictures of white spirits, so-called white spirits. They call them India spirits. 
and then the ones that are Chinese, they call them China or China spirits. And they'll try to say, well, you know, these are our ancient ancestresses and ancestors, these are the deities and so forth. In reality, they're the spirits of deceased white Indians, white Chinese, and so forth. Spirits of disorder that have no connection to any abosome at all. However, because the Vodou have left, but the shrine house is still there, the shrine implements are still there, their spirits have, you know, a place to take up residence in. So these perverse, white, discarnate spirits are taking up residence in these areas. Some of the deceased relatives of these Vodusis, some of them who are Muslims, some of them who are Christians, some of them who are just engaged in perverse disorder practices, they take up residence in these shrines. So now you have people who are engaged in practices going to these shrines. They're doing rituals. They're giving ritual offerings. They're doing what Koni Koni, Akua, Agberu normally would prescribe, but they're out of harmony with her because they have not rejected. It's critical. Inyamewa, Inyame, and Sheshe, divine order, is comprised of divine law and divine hate. So we live in harmony with divine order by incorporating those things that are lawful and rejecting those things that produce disorder. So we accept law, you know, and then we reject disorder. That's, that's our culture. If you're not, if you don't embrace divine hate and you don't reject, then you have no connection to Akua. And therefore she's not excreting because you're not living in harmony with her. You're not allowing her to excrete the toxins. It's just like you're not eating properly so your kidneys are not functioning properly. You're not allowing them to do their job. You're rejecting what Akua is trying to get you to do. You're accepting the whites and their offspring. You're accepting these images. You're accepting everything that you should be rejecting. So Akua is no longer present. Uh, the Arbos, any other Arbosome are no longer present. They do not dwell in disorder. It's one thing if you're making mistakes, you're ignorant to something, the Arbosome will help you correct. If you know that what you're doing is disordered and you decide you're going to do it anyway because of lust or because of malice, you become repulsive to and repulsed by the Arbosome and the Nananoma and Samanfo. So they're gone, and the only spirits left are the discarnate wayward spirits, those who are dead Muslims who are malicious or engaged in perverse, misguided, lustful behavior, those who are white Hindus, white Chinese, and so forth, as well as black people who are disordered spirits who are connected to those individuals who brought those lithographs from India or from China over to the western part of the continent. And they've been bringing those kind of images are, are trading for hundreds of years, but it just really, ever at least 500 years or so. But it really began to pick up about 100 years ago, and then after the end of World War I, it really began to pick up, and then in the 70s, it really exploded. And then you had, for example, people who are Vodusis, indigenous Vodusis, starting to reproduce these images on their own. They're communicating with these deceased white Hindu spirits, communicating with other deceased black Muslim spirits and others and reproducing white Hindu spirits as well as brown spirits that are in the same form of these so-called Hindu spirits. And then people, you know, they go get divination from these people. But because they don't have a proper emotional balance, even the ones who are not malicious, but they're just lustful, if you're lustful, you're desiring things that you don't need. You've been conditioned, you've been brainwashed, so now you're desiring things that you don't need and when you're presented with the truth, you reject it because all you want to do is serve your lust. So when you have people like that, they're repulsed by the Abosom, repulsed by the Ansamanfo, but they're ritual quote-unquote specialists. They're priests. They're priestesses. They engage in ritual work for the community and they've been in the community, they grew up in the community, so people come, they know who they are, they give them money, they give them different offerings, and then they get work done. And the only spirits these people are working with are discarnate, wayward spirits. So they engage in divination with discarnate, wayward spirits. Some of them from Afuraka, Afuraikai, some of them from India, some of them from China and other places. Some of them Muslim, some of them Christian, just dead spirits who are spirits of disorder. Sometimes those spirits will help the client 
because that locks the client in and gives the client confidence that these spirits are real and working. Sometimes they give them, very often, false information, give them false ritual practices, give them offerings that don't assist the people properly, don't help the situation, and what happens is the people come back and they're, they just don't understand what happened. I did everything I was told to do and it didn't work out. I'm still in a negative situation and my situation has gotten worse. The people who are ritual specialists, who are ignorant but lustful, what they will do is, and we're not necessarily trying to, you know, derail the client, they're just an ignorant, lustful individual and engaged in the practice of false um, ritual because they're not in harmony with the abosom. What they will do is, they'll blame the client. They'll say, well, it's, you know, it was you. You didn't uh, do the ritual correctly, or the abosom or the vodou, they decided they don't want to help you, or, you know, you weren't believing in it, you didn't have confidence in it, and you shut down the ritual yourself, and you need to be more focused, and you need to be more open to the ritual practices, and then, you know, things will work out. They will blame the client for the fact that what they gave them was a false ritual based on false divination with false divinities, and they blame the client to take the blame off of themselves, and very often the clients think it has something to do with them, and they, they continue. Those who are, are lustful and malicious, and they know they're engaged you know, in false divination, false ritual practices, not dealing with any abosom, they blame the client as well. Or sometimes they uh, consult the spirit and ask the spirit to do something for the client, so the client is hooked. And then the next time they get divination or the next time they need spiritual work, they ask the spirit not to do anything for the client. And the client goes into a hole, and then they come back to the priest or the priestess with, you know, with an exigency, an emergency, like I did everything I need to do and it's not working, things are worse, what do I do? And they say, well now we're going to have to go to a higher level, and we have to do more sacrifices, more ritual, because this is more serious, and so forth. So now they hook the person even further, and of course get more money out of the person, sex out of the person, um, whatever they're trying to get out of the person. So this is all a result of us not living in harmony with our Akra, living in harmony with our Nananum and Samafo, with our Abosom, because if we do that, then we'll be in harmony, or at least be open to the communications coming from all of the Abosom, which are all connected to us. They all have miniature shrines in our bodies, of course. One will be more dominant than all the others, who governs our Akra, but we have to live in harmony with all of the Abosom, just like you have to live in harmony with all of the organs in your body. Just like you have to live in harmony with all the aspects of the Earth Mother. Ocean, sun, um, sky, the rivers, and so forth. If we attune to our Akra, we place ourselves in alignment in general with the various Abosom, and if we make mistakes along the way, then our Nananum and Samafo and our Samafo Pa will help us, help us to get back on track. So this is just an example of when people are engaged in ritual uh, disorder, they begin to rationalize the disordered ritual and then the ritual offerings that they put forward are ill-effective. They just, they don't work. Okay, so any questions on on that? Because I know some people have, uh, that's, a, that's a problem in ancestral religion. But it all goes back to, it all goes back to us living in harmony with the Abosom that govern us but understanding who these Abosom are and who they are not. Um, we just recently, just today, well actually last night, we just released an article. The title of the article is, More Means Dead. Uh, we talked about this in a previous uh, webcast, broadcast, talking about the name More actually means death. Now. This article is more extensive, it goes into detail, we show the Medutu, the hieroglyphs that prove that the title Moor is actually a term that has to do with death, whether people are dead, the damned, the socially dead, those spirits of disorder, those people who are slaves, servants, vassals, and so forth. That was a term in ancient Kemet designating a certain group of people, a certain segment of society, spiritually and physically people who made their transition spiritually 
and they weren't in harmony with Akua. They didn't make that transition through that ritual space from the physical world to the spirit realm. They didn't make a true, uh, smooth transition. They became earthbound spirits. They would be called Meru, or the dead, or the quote unquote, the damned. And when you would see the Medutu, it's, it's a hieroglyph, hieroglyphic symbol with a man on one knee with an axe, and he's driving that axe right through the middle of his forehead. Forehead as a determinative symbol dealing with, you know, sp somebody who's spiritually dead, physically dead, culturally dead. On a social level, people call moru, plural, mer, or mor, which became more in, in English, but it's mer in ancient Kemet, M-R, sometimes M-E-R, M-A-R, but M-E-R, mer, became meru, plural. The socially dead were the people who were servants, who were slaves, for example, people who were uh, prisoners of war, uh, convicted felons, who became servants, so-called slaves, bondsmen, and so forth, serfs, vassals. This was the socially dead. If you, we quote a text from the instructions of Ptah Hetep, talking about you know certain kinds of individuals who are out of harmony with order, and they live their lives out of harmony with order, and they create disorder on a regular basis. And it says the officials say to people like that, there goes a living death every day. So they would refer to people as the living dead, just like some of us refer to uh, people who are drug addicts as the walking dead or the living dead because mentally and spiritually they're dead right now until they get some help. In ancient Kemet, we refer to people who were slaves, servants, um, engaged in disorder, dead or socially dead, they were called meru. And those who actually physically made their transition and were out of harmony with order, they were called Meru. That Meru became Moru and Moors in English. So we go into a detailed analysis. It's a 29-page document. Um, we posted it last night, so that information is out there. But that's related to what we were talking about with regard to Akua. If we don't get in harmony with her, then our temple enclosure, our ritual space, will be polluted. Our basin, our kukua, that carries the offerings to the Abosom and the Unsumafo, will be so overburdened with disordered, perverse toxins that our emotional balance will be off. So we won't have any spiritual fluid balance, we won't have any emotional balance, we'll be bombarded with energetic emanations from disordered entities, we'll absorb those energetic emanations, we'll internalize them, it corrupts our perception, then it begins to corrupt our ritual practice, and then when we engage in ritual offerings, we begin to engage in false divinations or support false divinations, engage in ritual prayers that are perverse, that only evoke disordered entities. We're not focused on the Abosom, and then when the Abosom come to us and try to give us real information, we reject them because our perception has been corrupted. And when somebody comes forward and says, listen, if anything has to do with some white images of spirits, that's not the Abosom, you don't need to deal with it. But if your perception has been so corrupted because you've accepted all these negative entities and you're emotionally and spiritually imbalanced because your renal system is not filtering and excreting the toxins out, you'll say, oh no, it doesn't matter that these spirits images are white, it doesn't matter that I have white Hindus in my house, you know what I'm saying, because the spirits are working with me anyway. It corrupts the perception, and that leads to a corrupt practice, a ritual practice. All right, so any questions on that? Any more questions on that? Give me one second. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to end it here because what we want to do next week we're going to focus on Yao well the, the next Akradin uh, Bosom is Yao, Ya, and Abba. We're going to focus on Yao next week which is Heru and um, Ancient Kemet. But we want to make sure that if you see the link study the, let me give you the link for I gave you the link for the Akul article but I want to give you this other link
Okay, this is the link. This is the link to the article I just mentioned. The uh, more means dead article. There are a number of people who have just recently uh, checked that article out. They've been downloading it. It's, it's kind of viral right now. Um, what has happened is very similar to uh, what's happened with ancestral religion being corrupted by, you know, Christianity, Catholicism, white saints, Islam, and so forth. Um, and we mentioned that Protestantism, um, Hinduism, even Taoism to a certain extent, Buddhism. Um, and, and when we mentioned the whole thing with Hinduism and Buddhism, yes, the ancient people of ancient India, the original people were black, the original people of Asia were black after they migrated from Afuraka, Afuraika to those areas. We did not begin in Asia. We didn't begin in a mythological continent called Mu. That's more foolishness from the whites and their offspring that a lot of black pe people have accepted. Um, we didn't begin in ancient America. That's foolishness. We began, black people began in Afuraka, Afuraika. That's where we originated. And then we migrated to the various continents and this of course happened before there were any other people on earth. What has happened with regard to ancient India, black people were there first, black people in Asia first, when the whites and their offspring came into being in northern Eurasia and began to invade uh, northwestern India, which is now northwestern India and Pakistan and so forth, and down into southern India and into further into Asia, into China, southern China. There were wars, of course, for centuries. Those wars are actually still going on. There are still black populations in China. There is a large black population in India. There are tens of millions of black people in India. I'm not talking about the straight hair, straight nosed brown people, but there are black people, for example, in the Andaman Islands and other places that are, look no different than any Nigerian, Ghanaian. They have full noses, full lips, uh, naturally spiraled hair, which some people call nappy hair or woolly hair, but are natural spirals, without any straight hair, without straight noses, and so forth. The same thing with black people in Australia. When you look at the earlier pictures that were taken over a hundred years ago, you'll see that people look no different than people on the continent. But at the closer you get to the present, when a lot of miscegenation began to occur, when the whites and their offspring in the 12,800s, the 1800s, began to really heavily hit Australia and began raping the women producing these um, different characteristics, you'll notice you start seeing more straight hair, different morphological characteristics, and so forth. When we talked about ancient India and ancient um, China, and some of these people dealing with Vodou and with other traditions, like in the Yoruba tradition, incorporating these spirits, they're not dealing with, you know, the ancient black spirits of ancient India. If you're having white images, um, and you have having images of Buddha and, and uh, Hanuman and these different entities, the ancient Abosom, of course, are not dealing or operating through these false images. That's number one. Number two, the ancestresses and ancestors of the real people of ancient India they work with their direct blood circle in India who still live there right now. Just like your ancestresses and ancestors are not going to go to, you know, Australia right now and start working with, you know, Australians. Even if they're indigenous black Australians, they're to work with you. They work through their blood circles because they have to return through their blood circles. So the ancestresses and ancestors who are honorable and spiritually cultivated, who are connected to real black people in India right now, they are working with real black people in India right now. The only spirits from India that are, you know, coming over connected with these, you know, these images of these false divinities are disordered spirits. Some of them are black disordered spirits and many of them, most of them, are white disordered spirits. The same with the ones in China. Um, when they show images of Buddha and with the serpents and so forth, and the people will say, well, you know, these are the same as Da and the various different uh, serpent divinities of Vodun. Yes, we have serpent divinities of Vodun. The original practices in ancient India, ancient Kemet, 
we're all the same because we're the same people we just migrated but these images are not carrying the power of the ancient divinities it's no different than ancient Kemet when the whites and their offspring invaded ancient Kemet and started destroying the uh, statues of Asara, Set, Heru and the different divinities and began to replace them with Osiris, Isis and Horus with white statues with the same names Osara, Set and Heru did not invest themselves in such statues for ritual practice they did not invest themselves in the temples where any of the whites and their offspring were they pulled out of that they had nothing to do with that those shrines were empty the same thing with people bringing black Buddha statues and so forth Buddha is just a perversion of the name Puta. there was no character named Buddha who ever lived so that's a fictional character manufactured by the whites and their offspring off of an original divinity so the real divinity Puta will never operate through a statue of Buddha who is a manufactured character who was designed to go against ancestral religion. The whole reason Buddhism exists was to a, is an attack on Afurakani, Afurakani and ancestral religion. The reason why Hinduism exists is because it was an attack on Afurakani, Afurakani and ancestral religion. So any of these images and any of these statues they're not dealing with real divinities and no real divinities are attached to any of them. So these people, what they're doing is they're making a lot of money off of people with false divinations and false initiations and false chieftainships and chieftainships and queen motherships and so forth. And they do a little clairvoyance for somebody or they engage in a little clear audience and they can see some spirits and hear a couple of spirits and tell you something that a disordered spirit that's connected to you, who's watching you, watching you go through certain things and then revealing that to the priest, so-called priest or priestess and then they repeat that to you and you say they must be real because they told me things that nobody else would know. Well, if somebody was sitting in your house and eavesdropping on you when you're on the telephone telling somebody uh, you know an intimate secret and that person got on the phone and told you know called somebody on the continent and told them this is what's going on in their life they're about to come get divination you wouldn't see that as magical, you wouldn't see it as spiritual, you'll see that as somebody who's a criminal eavesdropping on you and then reporting on you. Well a discarnate spirit can do the same thing. They will listen to what's going on with you and they will communicate with one of these priests or priestesses that they're working with and tell them your intimate secrets. So when you come to the shrine they'll tell you why you're there before you even say anything. They'll tell you what's going on in your life. That gathers your confidence, it builds your confidence and you are, you're like, alright, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it because you must be real. Alright, so that's what's, what's going on with, you know, India, China, and so forth. And the same thing with ancient America. Black people were in ancient America, but these um, migrants from Asia who are here now, these are not Afurakani, Afurakani people. They are migrants from Asia. Some of them, of course, mixed with uh, Europeans later on. We were here first. The migrants from Asia came later. The light-skinned, straight-haired migrants from Asia came later. These are not Afurakani, Afurakani people. They do not have Akra. None of them have any Abosom whatsoever at all. They're no different than any of the whites and their offspring anywhere else in the world. So if people are talking about some ancient Mayan, ancient, uh, you know, Aztec culture connected to these migrant Asians, and that these people are still custodians of the ancient wisdom and they have real shrines that's pure foolishness. The people are lying. Now the same thing happens with the so-called Moors. Black people were not calling themselves Moors in ancient times. Black people didn't start calling themselves Moors until white people started calling us Moors and it was a pejorative. White people, Greeks, Romans, and later Arabs who invaded ancient Kemet thousands of years ago, the Greeks and Romans over a couple of thousand years ago and then the Arabs later, they learned the language in Kemet, learned some of the language. Of course they began to imitate and dress like the ancient Kemal. They began to you know, um, engage in pseudo ritual practices and imitation of the ancient Kemal, the ancient Pera'a. They tried to you know, practice uh, statecraft like the Pera'a, the Pharaoh, the kings. Everything they did, they tried to imitate our ancient culture, including 
trying to learn the language and the script so they would build temples or, or you know, have temples built, you know, with the indigenous artisans, but have them built. They would have papyri, you know, drawn up. They would have stele carved. They would use the Greek language and then insert in a number of different roles and then they would have the demotic and then they would have, you know, the hieroglyphic or the medutu in different, you know, different scripts so you can tell um, what's being read in different languages. But they learned of the language. If you look at the Ptolemies, they were writing, you know, decrees in the medutu as well as Greek. They were having these things produced. They learned the language. They knew that there were a class of people, Meru, or Moru, Meru, who were the slaves, the dependents, the vassals, pejoratives, the socially dead. And they knew that when they died and made their transition, they were considered those spiritually dead people who were earthbound spirits who were quote unquote the damned. So they understood that Mer was that. So they used the term Mer and they corrupted it into more. And we show the etymology for that. There's also the term mer in ancient Kemet that means love, and that becomes more or amor, like me amor, my love in, in European languages. So just like mer means death or the dead, became more, which means the dead in, in ancient Kemet, going into English language. Same thing with mer meaning love, and more meaning love in the English, in the English language. So we go into detail about that. There's a very extensive analysis. But what happened was very similar to India, China, ancient America, and Christianity and so forth. Those people who embraced the whites and their offspring, embraced Islam, they tried to graft Islam onto ancestral religion. Anybody who embraced that foolishness and they rejected the Abosom, rejected the Vodou, re rejected the divinities, the Abosom didn't have anything to do with that. They, they pulled back. So the only spirits, of course, they had left to work with was these discarnate wayward spirits. And some of these individuals who were engaged in those practices back then are the same spirits that these people are pouring libation to now. These same spirits who are waging war against black people at the behest of white Arabs, they're pouring libation to them. They're praying to them. They're asking for ritual you know, offerings and giving ritual offerings to them. To people who are our arch enemies, they're giving offerings to. And these same people, just like they tried to get us to ally ourselves with the white Arabs when they were alive, they're trying to get us to ally ourselves with white Arabs from then from the spirit realm, from being earthbound, discarnate spirits. So when people say, Well, you know, I went to a shrine and the spirit possessed and said that, you know, we all come from Asia. No Abosom, no Vodou, no, you know, Orisha is going to tell that lie. But you can always find, when you trace these people and where their shrines came from, you will find that they were connected to some Muslim organization, um, connected to some so called, what now would be called a Moorish organization. They were connected with people who were dealing with spirits that were connected with Islam, connected with Christianity connected with some form of Judaism, even connected with uh, Hinduism or Buddhism or something dealing with the whites and their offspring. Those spirits will lie to our people just like they lie to our people right now. Just like white people will say that the Egyptians were white or the Egyptians were Asian and black people had nothing to do with civilization in ancient Kemet. When those spirits die, they will say the same thing. And we're foolish to uh, query these discarnate wayward spirits because they're just going to lie, just like they did here. If a slave master dies and we pour libation, like some people will tell you here in America, some so-called Akan people, so-called Yoruba people will tell you, hey, you didn't choose your ancestresses and ancestors, so you can't leave some of them out and only pour libation to the black ones. You have to pour libation to all of your people because they're all part of your bloodline. That's an absolute lie. That's pure foolishness. You don't accept spirits of disorder. You reject, hate spirits of disorder. You never pull libation to them. You never evoke them. You only repel them. But some people will tell the people to do that. And they will do it. So just like the slave master was lying to you about Jesus, 
and lying to you about white supremacy and black inferiority, you pour libation to that discarnate, wayward white spirit, they will come and they will lie to you about Jesus or tell you that they are Jesus and then you'll say, I just saw Jesus. They'll tell you that Muhammad was real. They'll tell you that, you know, black people are inferior. They'll tell you every lie that they told when they were living on earth because they're the same entity. So that's what's going on here in America. It's going on, of course, on the continent. And it's also going on with respect to some of these pseudo metaphysical groups, these pseudo um, spiritual groups, these pseudo comedic groups, all the information coming out dealing with extraterrestrialism, foolishness, they're dealing with wayward white discarnate spirits or brainwashed black discarnate spirits who used to work with the whites and their offspring when they were here. People dealing with drug addict spirituality, talking about you need to get high, you need to smoke weed, that's spiritual and so forth. That's pure foolishness. These are spirits of disorder. People talking about you need to connect with the whites and their offspring or there's no gender in the spirit realm, there's no color in the spirit realm. When you see a spirit communicating with you, you can see your ancestral spirit, you can see your great-grandmother, great-grandfather. They have color, they have gender, they will manifest the same way they manifested when they were living on earth 200 years ago. That's, you can identify that. Some people, you can see a picture of them. Some people can see the entity and then see a picture of the person they never seen before and say, that's the person I saw when I did libation or saw my dream because it's the same entity. They have color, they have gender, they have a personality, they are spirits. Just like you are a spirit operating through a physical body, when you leave your physical body, you're still the same image. So anybody dealing with that, that's, that's some foolishness. Pseudo-metaphysicians, pseudo-comedic um, practices that's basically dealing with the whites and their offspring and pseudo-New Age spirituality, and then they graft that into ancient comedic and say, this is what our people were doing for thousands of years. They read the hermetic texts and things like that, which are not afurakani, afuraikaitni. It's a mishmash of a handful of facts with a great deal of corruption around the facts. And the central theme is misinformation. It's not our ancient culture, but a lot of our people don't know that, so we embrace it. All we have to do is investigate any information that somebody gives us. Where did the information come from? What's the origin of the information? And who were the people connected with when they were getting this information and later passing it on? So all these people dealing with these different factions, whether it's extraterrestrialism, lost landism, meaning uh, mythological lost lands like Atlantis and Mu and other lost lands, that's more mythology, corruptions of stories of ancient Kemet made into mythologies to give white people a prominent position in the world and then black people come along blacken up that false story and then attribute it to themselves which is just layered foolishness. So this is what has happened with the whole Moorish so-called identity. You have the whites and their offspring taking, you know, taking aside a few blacks um, using them as agents to promote a false tradition to get us to get away from Afurakani, Afurakani, and ancestral religion. They will try to force you to believe that you're not Afurakani, Afurakani, you're not African, you're not black, you're Asian. They want you to have an Asian identity. The same white Arabs who raped and murdered our ancestresses and ancestors are the same people who are influencing the modern day contemporary white Arabs and their black agents, the same black agents who allied with the white Arabs to wage war against the blacks hundreds of years ago, they have reincarnated and they're allying with the white Arabs today to wage war against traditional religion all over again. They never stopped. And some of them are engaged in ritual practices where they're pouring libation to these white Arabs and to their black agent discarnate relatives and calling it an ancestral tradition, a sacred tradition, uh, an original Masonic tradition and all of this foolishness which has no basis in reality. So all those things are connected. They're all um, addressed with regard to the Moorish identity. Moor really meaning death and the dead people, the damned people. That's all in that article. Um, so that's cool. So you have any, any, any more questions on that? Okay, if no more questions, we're going to 
we're going to end it there. Um, if you have any questions later on, you can hit us up on our Ning site. Let me give you a link for that. Okay, so the Afuraka, Afurakai, the Ning.com. Okay, Yeni Aseda, Sister Njideka, just saw your message. Um, so, anybody have any questions on that? This video will be posted on the OJRAFO YouTube site, and that article just dropped early this morning. Um, we have some more information that we're going to be publishing. It's coming out very soon, so look for that. Um, so, we'll see you next week. Uh, mirase.